Coming up on Health Watch, cocooning. Have any idea what it is? Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Terrence F. Anderson, and this is Health Watch. Before we get to a rather unique definition of cocooning, I would like for you to spend just a few moments listening to something that will definitely get your attention. Here goes. Surely you recognize that sound. It's that of an infant in considerable distress. It is the sound of what is commonly known as whooping cough, pertussis. In recent years, the rate of pertussis infection in infants six months of age and younger has increased exponentially by as much as 20 times. The result? In 2010, there were 27,550 cases of pertussis in the U.S. In Virginia alone, there were 344 cases. You should know that these numbers are expected to increase in 2011. In just a moment, we're going to explore a novel new concept in the treatment of pertussis, cocooning, one being aggressively launched by the Hampton Roads Districts of the Virginia Department of Health. But first, let me share with you why this is so very important. 91% of pertussis deaths in the last decade were in infants, six months of age or less. More than 50% of infants less than one year of age who contract pertussis must be hospitalized. Coughing fits due to pertussis infection can last up to 10 weeks or more, with the disease being communicable in the first three weeks. Less than 10% of adults have protection from pertussis. Four out of five adults with the disease are capable of spreading the germ and will have no symptoms. Most adults with pertussis don't seek medical treatment and are not diagnosed. But the thing that is particularly unsettling, and the reason why we're here today, is that some 80 to 85 percent of the source of pertussis in infants are parents, family members, and caretakers. However, health district directors from around Hampton Mills are working together in a dynamic campaign to stem the tide of pertussis in the metropolitan region. It is called cocooning. Because of the importance of this novel new campaign, we're going to do something a little different on this edition of Health Watch. I will have only one guest, Dr. Demetria Lindsay, Director of Norfolk Health District, for a one-on-one -on -one interview. The cocooning initiative is of particular interest to Dr. Lindsay, and I'm anxious to get into our discussion. Welcome to Health Watch, Dr. Lindsay. Thank you. It's so good to be here. I'm glad to have you back. It's been a little while. It has been. Okay, so what is pertussis? Pertussis is an infection that um, affects uh, people in all stages of life. Mm -hmm. And it's associated with that characteristic cough that, that you heard earlier. So it is an infectious illness that's very easily passed from one person to another. Okay, now I know what a cocoon is. I think butterflies and the chrysalis and so forth. But could you explain, please, to our, our viewers exactly what cocooning is? Cocooning is a concept that we, uh, we adopted that term from what you see with a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Before the butterfly is mature and able to protect itself, it is in a protective shell called a cocoon. For infants, before they are old enough or have been properly immunized against a whooping cough, what we want to do is surround them by that uh, environment of protection. And we do that by vaccinating individuals who, around them who may be more likely to pass the serious illness on to uh, the infant. What local health districts are involved in this initiative? Uh, this is, this is a project that has been adopted by all of the health districts in the state. However, the eastern region districts have taken a lead in terms of piloting this approach uh, in trying to prevent illness among our infants here. Now, I noted earlier that some 80 to 85 percent of uh, the source of processes are uh, parents and uh, caregivers. Why is that the case? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that immunity wanes over time. Uh, during childhood, the average person should have received five doses of the uh, pertussis vaccine in the form of DTAP, and that's at, at two months, mm -hmm. four months, six months, 15 to 18 months, and then when they enter school. However, that immunity doesn't always last 
into, into adulthood. So uh, immunity may have waned. And on top of that, the adult may not have as m uh, many symptoms as the child. In fact, as you mentioned earlier, four out of five adults may have little to no symptoms at all. So it, in addition to that, it is not a, an illness that is thought of or very easily recognized in adults or diagnosed in adults. So what are the symptoms of ptosis? Generally, after about anywhere from four days to 21 days after exposure, mm -hmm. an individual will typically have mild flu-like symptoms. That may be a runny nose, a slight sore throat, uh, a mild cough, perhaps a low-grade fever or no, or no fever at all. That is followed by what we consider the characteristic signs of, of pertussis. That includes that um, rapid paroxysmal cough, um, that is so severe that the individual has to gasp to catch their breath at the end of that cough and you hear the inspiratory whoop. Also, uh, the person may be extremely fatigued after having this cough for so long. They may have um, vomiting after the cough mm. or be extremely tired and in some cases you may also notice that there's cyanosis or blueness around the mouth and, and uh, inside of the mouth because they're just not getting enough oxygen uh, during those periods of time that they're coughing so heavily. In contrast, the infant may, very, at a very young age, may not have that severe cough, and what you may see are periods in which the infant stops breathing, what we call apneic spells. Uh, this, where they just completely stop breathing? Where they stop breathing. Now, the, the, we were talking earlier, and there is something called stage three uh, pertussis, that's the convalescence stage. Can you uh, just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, basically, after, um, I, I should say that uh, that period that I mentioned earlier when they have mild uh, respiratory symptoms and, and may think they just have a common cold is mm -hmm. probably the most infectious. And then up to about two weeks after that severe cough starts, they may continue to be infectious. But the infection may continue to lag as the cough um, begins to slowly decrease in what we consider the convalescent stage. And that may be a gradual decrease in the symptoms that may go on for weeks or even months. During that period, the individual may also be susceptible to other infections as well so they can continue having a cough even even longer. Now we've talked about uh, DTAP and uh, now TDAP. Uh, what does the TDAP include and, and, and what does it protect against? I guess we've, we're talking around it now, but can you again give us some more information? Um, the TDAP vaccine uh, includes tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and the pertussis is the component of it that is the vaccine against whooping cough. What are the side effects of the shot? Because we, we have a very uh, paranoid uh, society sometimes when it comes to getting shots, but, but the side effects are pretty minimal, aren't they, for the Tdap? Yes, the Tdap has been shown to be uh, very well tolerated. Uh, side effects uh, have been rel relatively mild or minimal. Uh, an individual may have some redness or soreness at the site of the injection. Um, in rare cases, they may also have a mild fever or a moderate fever. It would be un very unusual. So a very tolerated, well-tolerated uh, vaccine in general. So who is recommended to get the Tdap immunization? Well, essentially um, for the for pertussis vaccine in general, pretty much in all stages of life, it's very mm -hmm. it's important to have it. Specifically for the Tdap, which is the booster, uh, that is recommended um, for individuals uh, beginning at uh, 11 to 12 years of age. That's the adolescent. Mm -hmm. So we are requiring that now for adolescents going from fifth to sixth grade in school. Uh, also, it is recommended that uh, young adults or adults have at least one of their booster shots uh, to uh, be the Tdap vaccine. So in the past, you may have heard that every 10 years you should get your tetanus, mm -hmm. or, or at least at, for a while we started saying the diphtheria tetanus. Now we're recommending 
that at least one of those boosters um, be the Tdap vaccine to include the pertussis. Now we're particularly concerned with the cocooning concept that anyone who thinks they may be in close proximity to an infant, mm -hmm. particularly one less than six months of age, should be really sure that they get that vaccine. And you don't have to wait for 10 years to get that vaccine. Um, it is recommended at least two years, but you can get it even earlier if need be. So we're very concerned about parents, and we're recommending that for women. It is now okay to, um, the guidelines have changed that it is acceptable for women to receive it in the last uh, couple of weeks of the second trimester or in the third trimester mm -hmm. of their pregnancy. If they didn't receive it during that period of time, uh, immediately after they have given birth so that they are protecting that infant. Uh, also for fathers, for siblings who are in the household, for grandparents and caretakers of the infant. It's also extremely important. And also for healthcare workers who may be working, be, may be in close contact with infants. It's also recommended for college students. But if we think about our lives, we all love to admire that beautiful little baby of our friends, of our relatives, even people that we see in the grocery store, we may want to stop and admire the baby. So it's, it's a community responsibility, and we all want to be sure that we're doing everything we can to protect our infants and children. I, I want to go to a break in just a moment, but before we do so, if you could just quickly give us uh, some idea of the treatment options for uh, pertussis. Uh, treatment is with antibiotics, and those include azithromycin, mm -hmm. clarithromycin, and erythromycin. They may help uh, if, tr if given very early, uh, possibly decrease the severity of the illness, but most importantly, it does decrease the opportunity for transmission of the infection from the ill person to other people. So it's very important that if there is any potential that someone has the infection, that they do take the antibiotics to ensure that they won't pass it on to someone who may um, have severe problems with it, such as an infant less than six months of age. Boy, that, uh, that mycin family, uh, yes. <laughs> they're pretty important. Huh? <laughs> yes, they are. All right, so let's take a break, and we're going to come back and uh, continue our discussion. And, and I'd like to talk about the, uh, the historical trends of uh, uh, pertussis. All right? So. All right. Uh, we're going to ask that you stick around. We're going to take a momentary break here, and I think you'll be very pleased to see who else is very much interested in getting the message out about cocooning and uh, the Tdap. Stay tuned. Hi, it's Jennifer Lopez. I'm here to talk to you about pertussis, more commonly known as whooping cough. This is a respiratory infection that can be potentially fatal to your baby. Did you know that babies aren't protected against pertussis until they've completed their infant series of vaccinations? This could take up to six months or more. Or that when researchers were able to identify who was responsible for spreading pertussis most often to young infants, it was their own parents about half of the time? And did you know that one of the best ways to help protect yourself and reduce the risk of spreading pertussis to your baby is to get yourself and those around you vaccinated? Well, now you know. Help spread the word about pertussis and tell everyone, especially those in close contact with your baby. Help the March of Dimes and Santa Fe Pastor end the sounds of pertussis. Do it for your baby. I did. Learn the facts about pertussis, including how to protect your baby and what questions to ask your doctor. And don't forget, spread the word. Welcome back to Health Watch. My name is Terrence Afro Anderson. Our topic today is pertussis and cocooning. My guest is Dr. Demetria Lindsay, the health director at Norfolk Department of Public Health. We're going to get back into our discussion now and uh, talk a, a little bit about the historical trends of pertussis. And we're going to put a nice little graphic up on the screen. All right. In the early 1900s, we saw very high cases of pertussis in this country. 
And then around 1914, of course, we had the first vaccine that was offered for pertussis. And progressively, we saw uh, more um, different combinations of vaccine avail available and a dramatic dec decline in the rates of pertussis in this country uh, till uh, we reached a, a significant low around 1976. But since that time, we've noticed a gradual uh, increase in rates of uh, pertussis infection and here in recent years dramatic increases uh, around the country and also in Virginia. Uh, we are also continuing to see that we have seen a number of outbreaks across the state and also in this region and just this year in 2011 so far we've already seen double uh, the cases that we saw in the entirety of 2010. So significant increases in infection. You know, I'm, I'm one that's very big on show and tell when we do health watching. So we're going to put a couple more graphics up on the screen I'd like for you to elaborate on. Uh, the first one is uh, hospitalizations and complications uh, in uh, infants uh, less than 12 months of age. Well, children um, or infants who acquired a pertussis infection are much more likely to be hospitalized. Over half the infants uh, who require this infection require hospitalization and may um, experience significant complications from the infection, including as uh, pneumonia, seizures, and even deaths. And this is in dramatic comparison to adults who may be totally asymptomatic and uh, have very few symptoms of the disease. Uh, the next graphic that we'll put up is hospitalizations uh, by age group uh, from the years 1997 to 2000. And again, I think you can see here, uh, this, is, this uh, slide overlaps with the rate of infection that we see in the different age groups. And uh, the telling thing about this slide is, as you see the large bars, uh, there are a, a large number of infections in the less than six month old and also mm. in young adults you see very high rates of infection as well. However, in contrast, uh, even though rates of infection may be high in young adults, hospitalizations are extremely low, but we're seeing very high rates of hospitalizations in the very young. Can you elaborate a, a bit on the impact of, uh, of pertussis on adolescents and adults like, like uh, absence from school and absence from work and so forth? Yes, we do see very um, associated with it significant um, absences from school for adolescents who have infection as much as five and a half days for, the, for adolescents. Also adults uh, tend to miss significant number of days uh, in those who are symptomatic with pertussis infection. And then, of course, for parents who are taking care of children, there is an impact also with them having to stay home to take care of their children. You know, it's, it's interesting how pertussis particularly impacts adults. Again, like four to five, they will not exhibit any uh, symptoms, uh, the, the delay of the diagnosis and, and the care. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for adolescents, uh, for, I'm sorry, for adults, their symptoms may be so mild that they don't really realize that they have the infection. Mm -hmm. Only about one in five will have significant symptoms at all. So, um, and so it's not a disease that's readily thought of as being the cause of an upper respiratory infection in an adult. For those who do end up going to, the, uh, to um, seek medical care, it may take multiple visits before this diagnosis comes up. Uh, so many, even when they do seek medical care, may go undiagnosed because of the fact that it's just uh, the symptoms are mild and it's not the, the most readily thought of source of infection for adults. Uh, in the meantime, there are they are passing this infection on to very young children and infants who may be, they may be in close contact with. And this is particularly critical for the infant who cannot protect themselves. Are there any adults that have immunity to pertussis? 
Well, some adults may, but the rates are very low. Around 6% of adults are thought to have immunity to pertussis. Mm -hmm. um, also, un unfortunately, at this time, which is part of the reason for our efforts, very few adults are getting the, t the Tdap booster. They may get a diphtheria, tetanus booster, or a tetanus booster when they see their doctor, but it may not have the pertussis component in it to protect from disinfection. And that rate is very low, around 20% of adults. As I was doing research uh, and writing the script here, I, I saw that there were some pretty impressive numbers on the efficacy of the Tdap vaccination for infants. Can you uh, give us some insight there? As I mentioned earlier, that series starts with the infant at two, four, and six months of age, mm -hmm. ideally. However, the rates of in, um, immunity or protection for the infant don't really dramatically increase until or not significantly high enough to assure protection until they've had that third vaccine. So less than half with the first dose will have immunity, around two-thirds uh, with that second dose and then over 90% with the third dose. However, it again begins to wane around time to go to school, so, which is why uh, at four to six years of age, uh, the recommendation is that they have that fourth dose. Now, we, we um, touched, I'm yes. sorry, go right ahead. Yes, the fourth dose. Okay, the, we, we touched upon this a little earlier as well uh, uh, in terms of the recommend, uh, those folks that are recommended to get the immunization. Uh, but in 2006, the CDC kind of uh, expanded that. Uh, any uh, information you can give us on that? If I could go back and correct a minute, um, the sure. fourth dose is actually at 15 to 18 months, and then the fifth dose is at four to six years uh, for the infant and young children. Okay, fourth, the fourth dose, again, is 15 to 18 months. 15 to 18 months, okay. and then the fifth dose would be uh, upon school in entry at four to six years of age. Now, is that, a, is that something that the CDC uh, in 2006 uh, expanded, or is that, uh, I guess that, that, that goes back before 2006? Th those have been basic standard recommendations. Um, the expansion included um, recently the FDA approval for women to have the pertussis vaccine in the late second and third trimester. Mm -hmm. Also the recommendation of really focusing on um, anyone who is in close contact with the infant having vaccine, particularly uh, parents, grandparents, and healthcare workers. Uh, also, just very recently, the FDA has approved one form of the vaccine, the Boostrix, uh, for um, boost for uh, vaccination of individuals greater than 65 years of age. It was prior to that up to that uh, age of 64, but now 65 years of age and older can also get the vaccine, which is very important if you're a grandparent. How about it? Uh, and yes. you know, we had a former employee uh, come back to get a, a shot just very recently. Yes, in our discussions, we've run across a number of grandparents who want to do everything they can to protect their young grandchild. And this is a gift that's easy to give to your grandchild to protect them do everything you can to protect them from that infection. I think it's, it's pretty important, Dr. Lindsay, that, that we have, in fact, uh, restated some of the, uh, reinforced some of those things that we actually pointed out earlier. Um, but let's go on to something different now. Um, and that's the, the projections of how successful this cocooning initiative could be over a 10-year period of time. Uh, those, again, were pretty impressive numbers, uh, and, and the, the, the benefits of indeed in developing our infants in a cocoon and in a protective environment. Yes, we expect that uh, the whole purpose of this is to decrease dramatically, hopefully, the number of infants who may have infection and uh, the number of cases of infant deaths. And the projections uh, range anywhere from uh, 100, over 160,000 to 800,000 of cases being prevented, as much as 1,700 to 8,600 cases of infants less than a year not having uh, this infection and preventing as much as 60 to 30 plus deaths in infants. 
very dramatic numbers, and, and I can see why yes. you speak with so much passion and have so much interest uh, in, in cocooning. Uh, I, I remember when I first heard about it, when you introduced it uh, under the Pop and Watt staff meeting, it was, it was very fascinating. Yes, and it is. I mean, it's one of those things we can prevent. There is something we can do about this very serious uh, infection. Now, uh, suddenly our viewers are going to have some questions. I'd like to get more information. Can you give us uh, some resources where they can go to get more information? Of course, you can always call your local health department. Okay. And uh, you uh, also can uh, contact us um, at 683-2801. That's 683-2801. You may also visit the health department's uh, website, mm -hmm. vdh.virginia, spelled out, dot gov. Uh, as well as the CDC website, that's the Centers for Disease Control, mm -hmm. cdc.gov. And another important website is whyimmunize.org slash information. And that's a very important source for families. Well, I want to thank you so very much for coming on. And again, I'm just delighted to have you come back on the show. And we should do this more often. We should. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. You're quite welcome. And we want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Health Watch. Remember, you can check out previous editions of Health Watch online by going to www.norfolk.gov. If you'd like to drop me a line, you can email me at terrence.afford-anderson at vdh.virginia, and again, Virginia is spelled out, .gov. Please also feel free to give me a call at 757-683-8836. That number is 757-683-8836. We want to thank you so very much for joining us. Joining us for this edition of Health Watch, and the topic was cocooning and pertussis, uh, as well as the Tdap vaccination. This has been Health Watch. My name is Terrence Afri Anderson, and we'll see you the next time. Thank you very much.